the General Davy chapter is delighted to present a celebration of 100 years of votes for women. You will hear from Dr. Elna Green, followed by Lillian Walker as Susan B. Anthony and Ms. Marjorie Dannenfeldser. Dr. Elna Green is a native North Carolinian. She studied history at Wake Forest University in Winston-Salem, earning a bachelor's and master's degree. She continued her studies at Tulane University in New Orleans, Louisiana, earning a doctorate in American history. Her professional career includes professorial and administrative positions of increasing profile at several universities, including Tulane, Sweetbriar College in Virginia, Florida State University at Tallah in Tallahassee, Florida, San Jose State University in California, and currently Augusta University in Georgia, where she serves as the Dean of Pamplin College of Arts, uh, Humanities, and Social Sciences. She's a member of the American Historical Association, the Organization of American Historians, uh, the Southern Historical Association, and the Southern Association of Women Historians. That's a lot of organizations. <laughs> Dr. Green is the author of several books, including Southern Strategies, Southern Women and the Women's Suffrage Question, which brings her here today. Dr. Green is an expert on the question of women's suffrage and particularly the anti-suffrage movement. Her expertise will set the scene and allow us to appreciate the full measure of the challenge the suffragettes faced a century ago. Next, we will hear from Lillian Walker. Lily's a member of the Dolly Madison Society Children of the American Revolution. She will recite a speech by Susan B. Anthony entitled on women's right to vote, which was given by Anthony after her arrest for casting an illegal vote in the presidential election of 1872. Anthony makes a constitutional argument using the vote for women um, with a full rhetorical panoply of ethos, pathos, and logos. This attorney is persuaded. Last but not least, we will hear from Marjorie Dannenfelser. Ms. Dannenfelser is also a native North Carolinian, born in Greenville, North Carolina. She graduated from Duke University with a degree in philosophy. We welcome her back to Durham. Ms. Dannenfelser is the president of the Susan B. Anthony List, a 504C4 uh, nonprofit focused on the issue of abortion. Ms. Dannenfelser's success in the area of women's political issues is an apt tribute to the persuader, Ms. Anthony. Ms. Dannenfelser was also named Politico's Magazine's Top 50 Influencers of 2018 and also one of the Washington Examiner's Top 10 Political Women on the Move. She regularly contributes to Fox News, CNN, CBN, EWTN, and NPR in the Washington Post and National Review. Ms. Dannenfelser currently serves as a commissioner on the Women's Suffrage Centennial Commission, which brings her here today. The commission was created by an act of Congress to ensure a suitable observance of the centennial of the passage and ratification of the 19th Amendment of the Constitution of the United States providing for women's suffrage. You can visit the commission's website at www.womensvote100.org for a resource treasure trove on women's suffrage. Today, we have the opportunity to hear from Ms. Stanisfelter about the suffragettes, their movement, and the 19th Amendment, which grants us the right to vote. Please welcome our speakers, beginning with Dr. Elna Green. Um, I always talk about the difference between the words suffragist and suffragette, okay? We've, we've heard suffragette a couple of times, and I'm going to tell you how and why you would want to use that and when you wouldn't want to. Um, it's a common mistake to say suffragette to mean all suffragists. Um, and I, I give some credit or blame for that to Paul McCartney and David Bowie. <laughs> Wings, if you remember, Lady Jet was a lady, suffragette, remember that one? And uh, Suffragette City, anybody, anybody with me? All right, Suffragette City. Okay, so they were, they were both British. They were using the British term for the suffragists who were radicals, the extremists. Um, so the more radical branch of, of the suffrage movement um, <coughs> was, um, that's a, the suffragettes. The suffragettes were the ones who poured acid on the golf courses, spelling out the words, votes for women, in the grass. They were the ones who would own hunger strikes 
They were the ones who attacked Winston Churchill with a horse whip. They were the ones who used a catapult to toss projectiles at the prime minister. <laughs> Those were the, the suffragettes, okay? Um, there were very few American women who could be called suffragettes. Uh, most of them were suffragists. The vast majority of American suffragists condemned those tactics and they wanted to be, um, as, uh, they wanted to win the vote as ladylike as possible. So suffragette is a term that's properly used for the radicals, but the opponents of women's suffrage like to use that label against the suffragists and tarnish them all as suffragettes. In other words, they're all radicals. So they would say suffragette as a way of denigrating them and making them seem more radical than they were. So it's suffragist is the general term for all of us. The suffragettes were the radicals. And I say today, here and now, all of us embrace our inner suffragette and yell, votes for women, with me, votes for women, votes for women. Yes, there you go, my sisters, you are suffragettes. Okay, all right. Um, so let's, let's get, when, when you see, if we do get a presentation, when you see the term suffragette here, you, I want you to understand where that word comes from and who's using it for what reason, okay? All right, so today it is 1919. We are actually at the 100th anniversary of 1919. We're not at the 100th anniversary of the, of the suffrage movement being passed. It's the 100th anniversary of 1919. Um, and we are going to, to talk about what it felt like in 1919, in the very hot summer of 1919, when Congress passed the 19th Amendment and sent it out to the states for ratification. Three-fourths of the states had to approve. That's what's required to get a, an amendment to the Constitution. At that time, that meant 36 states needed to approve uh, the suffrage amendment. In 1919, when uh, state legislators and voters across the country took up the issue of women's suffrage, they could not just think about suffrage on its own. It was um, connected to every other political issue of the day. And that's true today, too. You can't usually separate things out. They are connected to one another. Um, so you couldn't just say, in most cases, <coughs> excuse me, you couldn't just say woman suffrage is fair and equal. Um, it's for equal citizens. It got connected to other political issues of the day. <coughs> so in 1919, when the Congress passed the 19th Amendment, sent it to the states, it was connected to everything around us. The Red Scare, the Black Scare and the Feminist Scare of 1919. The Red Scare first, <clears throat> not the Joe McCarthy one. This is the 1919 Red Scare. We had one just after the end of the First World War. The Bolshevik Revolution had resulted in a communist government in Russia. Um, the return home of the troops from World War I had triggered a post-war recession. We saw strikes, labor uprisings, uh, the growth of radical movements in the U.S. And although the fear of the Red Menace was probably greater than the actual Red Menace, nonetheless, there was a real uh, native radical movement in the, the United States in 1919. There were real native-born and immigrant radicals uh, in 1919. So that's the Red Scare. That's the context of what's going on in 1919. Then there's the Black Scare. Uh, lynchings and racial violence had been on the rise before the First World War, but immediately after, after the war, when all the, the troops came back, the United States saw a dramatic outbreak of violence, spurred on in part by the vision of black troops returning in uniform, having served, having fought, having earned their veteran status, and they were intimidating to many people. A generation had, had proved its right, to, uh, it's proved its ability to fight, and now we're going to come home and, and fight for their civil rights. Um, they were met with astonishing violence. Uh, the summer of 1919, the United States was swept by race riots, lynchings, violence that wiped out entire neighborhoods, sometimes even entire towns. And it was not just in the South, it is not just a Southern thing. 
Um, it was across the country. The summer of 1919 has earned a place in infamy in our history. It was a bloody hot summer. So that's the black scare. Then there's the feminist scare. Women had taken on new jobs during the war, replacing men in factories. And many Americans had not really come to grips with that fact. It was shocking to many men to return home and find that their wives and sweethearts had learned how to drive cars while they were gone. <laughs> Just as perplexing, women were being recruited into the labor movement. They were joining in some of those strikes. They were joining in those labor disputes. Middle class women were joining in the picket lines with the working class women. And most frightening of all over here, Margaret Sanger and the birth control movement. Women were seeking biological liberation. Um, this was a real challenge to the patriarchy. If biology isn't destiny, then what else might not be preordained? So this was the feminist scare of 1919. Women seemed emboldened after the war more self-confident in many cases, more experienced. They'd been out earning a paycheck for some of them who had never done so before. Um, the idea that a woman would stand in front of the White House and protest the president as Kaiser Wil Wilson, well, there was just no clearer evidence that the world had gone mad. <laughs> so women were part of both the Red Scare and the Black Scare. Look at this line of workers again. So these are women, they are workers, there are black workers in the middle of this group. So this links them, all this image I think helps to link them all together, um, the way that they are linked in the minds of some in 1919. Possibly even more so in this image, black women wanting the right to vote too. So this is the context for the suffrage movement in 1919. This is what is happening in the culture. And this is what people could not help but think about when they were now being asked, should women be given the right to vote? Nice arguments about simple justice and equal rights for equal citizens and no taxation without representation. Those ideas were not as persuasive, or maybe I should say they were not as powerful as the fear that they had to overcome, those fears that were around us in the culture. So how did women then argue for women's suffrage against all that fear? How did they try to make a case that could overcome all those fears? So they appealed to sentimentality. Let mothers vote. Mothers need the vote. Mothers will protect us. Mothers will protect their babies. Um, so we, we need mothers to vote. This was one of the ways to try to overcome this fear of the, what might happen with women with the vote. Mothers, our, our food, our health, our play, our homes, our school, our work, all of them are regulated by men's vote. Think about it and give mother the vote, the babies are asking. <laughs> so that's one way. Um, so the women appealed, to, the suffragists appealed to um, motherhood. They also appealed to patriotism. Men had never had to prove their patriotism to be allowed to, to vote, right? They had gotten the right to vote by being male citizens. They never had to go and prove they were patriotic before they were allowed to vote. But women be argued, we served in World War I, we served at home, we served abroad, we served in the Red Cross, we, we supported the, the war effort, we were patriotic, we deserved the vote. And there was lots of images linking women's patriotism to the right to vote. Wilson, Woodrow Wilson said that this is what convinced him to change his position. He had opposed women's suffrage for years, but it was women's war work, he said, that convinced him to change his mind and support the suffrage amendment. So this was an argument that held sway. Uh, and it's an argument that held, it, it, it was something to conjure with, it, as we would say in New Orleans. <laughs> the suffragists also tried to appeal to those labor unions and tried to appeal to organized labor. To say, if you are interested in, in workers' power, well, double the, work for, double the votes of the workers, right? Give women the right to, to vote as well. Um, 
you can't get what you want if you have no vote. So they're appealing to women, um, to appealing to, to labor organizations on behalf of women. <coughs> um, so dis uh, despite the fact that m most Americans were concerned about organized labor, they still wanted, the suffragists still wanted to get um, the labor voters to support woman suffrage. Probably the, the biggest bulk of arguments on behalf of woman suffrage was the argument that women would do good things with the vote, that they would vote in good reforms, they would vote in positive things once they got the vote. Um, they would vote in good laws, and prohibition was one of the prime examples. Women were very much behind the prohibition movement. Um, later, of course, they would be very much behind getting rid of the prohibition <laughs> movement. <laughs> but women had been part and parcel of that effort. And, th and the argument was women would be uh, supporting other positive reforms that, the sis that Americans wanted at this time. Pure food and drug laws, regulations and inspections of meat, uh, child labor regulations, all of these things, um, women with the vote would vote in. So that's an argument on behalf of giving women the vote. And of course, they are, um, <coughs> they're going to, um, uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry, this has got all of this whole, all of them listed together here. They're gonna abolish the white slave traffic. They're gonna vote in pure milk. They're gonna vote in fa uh, factory regulations. They're gonna vote <coughs> in all of these things. So the best way to get these, these reforms is to get women to vote. And if politics are dirty, you call in women who are gonna <laughs> clean up the politics. <laughs> <laughs> call in the cleaning, cleaning women. <laughs> so it's, it's about, some of this is about image, right? It's about what is it that women will do with the vote, not just the simple egalitarianism of it, but what will women do with it? The suffragists also had to spend a great deal of time controlling their image in the popular media. Um, the the antis, the opponents of women's suffrage, like to say, <coughs> like to present that the women who were suffragettes, notice the word here, mm -hmm. the suffragettes were ugly old maids who couldn't get husbands and so they needed to vote on their own, their own behalf. So they like to tarnish them as ugly, as old maids, as masculine, occasionally even going so far as to suggest that they were lesbian. And that's why they wanted the vote. So this is anti-suffragism here. Um, so this is the image that the antis were trying to, to project. So the women are going to, in, the suffragists instead are going to try to present images of purity, um, beautiful elegance, what they were always well coiffed, they're gonna have that hair fixed, they're gonna have that hat on, they're gonna have those gloves on, um, they're gonna present themselves in the most dignified and often elegant way that they possibly can. They're never going to be accused of being radicals, they're never going to be accused of being ugly old spinsters. They're going to emphasize how, um, uh, how they are not, they are not leaving their children at home, neglecting them. The, the antis, I want to vote, he says, but my wife won't let me. I'm home washing clothes because my wife won't let me vote. Um, and here's a suffragette's home. Uh, the children are neglected. The husband comes home and he's obviously he's worked a hard day. It says after a hard day's work, mom has left a note saying, I've gone to a suffrage meeting. <laughs> Um, and, and this ain't no man's job, this little boy says. So all of this argument is, or all of this imagery is to suggest that only these kind of women would want to vote. This is what happens when women want to vote. This is what happens to the family when women go out and vote. So the suffragists had to respond in kind. They pictured themselves in domestic scenes that was uh, very elegant, genteel domestic imagery. Certainly they're gonna show that their children are well cared for, they are not neglected, they are well cared for, she's reading to them a story. Um, and, and yes, women suffragists can cook. The, the woman <laughs> suffrage cookbook. <laughs> Tried and true way of raising money for women's organizations everywhere, right? But women can cook and we're gonna make sure you understand, us suffragists, we can cook. So they're, they're responding to these arguments that, that 
um, suffrage uh, ruins home life and that men were emasculated by suffrage by depicting instead these are lovely domestic women who want the right to vote. Uh, another way that they tried to control public image was to keep the questions about black voters out of the discussion as much as possible. They did not want to include black women in the suffrage organizations. They wanted them to be separate. They did not want them to be highlighted and on the front page. They got to be kind of at the back of the parade. Um, they tried very hard not to highlight black suffragists because they were so afraid of the race question muddying the woman suffrage question. So this was another way of trying to control the public image of the suffrage movement. So this is 1919. This is the world in which all the states now have to consider what is, what is it that we're going to do with this uh, amendment that's been submitted to us. This is the context in which all of these legislators uh, were considering um, the, the suffrage amendment. Today, it is, um, we, we think of it as just a natural equality. Women are citizens, women are equal citizens, they should vote. In 1919, it was very hard to say that. In 1919, it was very hard to think that. <coughs> Susan B. Anthony here will speak to us in a minute, <laughs> but <laughs> at, before her death, she said, oh, if I could live but another century, and see the, fruition, the fruition of all the work for women, there is so much yet to be done. In 1906, when Susan B. Anthony died, there were only four states where women could vote. Um, in 1919, when the Congress uh, passed the 19th Amendment, there were still only 17 states that let women vote, and only one of those was in the South, that was Arkansas. So it was not at all clear in 1919 that women's suffrage was going to pass. I just laid a, a foundation for you to understand. In 1919, it was not clear that women were going to get the vote. Um, and knowing this, I find it all the more remarkable to think about what those uh, suffragists did to earn the right to vote, what it was they did to make this successful. Every time, every time I go and vote, and I vote religiously, every time I go and vote, I think about what it took to make women's suffrage happen. 72 years of suffrage agitation by three generations of suffragists. That's what it took to get women's suffrage through. Thank you very much. Susan, you're up. Friends and fellow citizens, I stand before you tonight under indictment for the alleged crime of having voted at the last presidential election without having a lawful right to vote. It shall be my work this evening to prove to you that in thus voting, I not only committed no crime, but instead simply exercised my citizens' rights, guaranteed to me and all United States citizens by the National Constitution, beyond the power of any state to deny. The preamble of the federal constitution says, we, the people of the United States of America, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this constitution for the United States of America. It was we, the people, not we, the white male citizens, nor yet we, the male citizens, but we, the whole people, who formed the Union. And we formed it not to give the blessings of liberty, but to secure them, not to the half of ourselves and the half of our posterity, but to the whole people, women as well as men. And it is a downright mockery to talk to women of their enjoyment of the blessings of liberty while they are denied the use of the means of the only way of securing them provided by this democratic Republican government, the ballot. For any state to make sex a qualification that must ever result in the disenfranchisement of one entire half of the country is to pass a bill of attainder, or an ex post facto law, and is therefore a violation of the supreme law of the land. By it, the blessings of liberty are forever withheld from women and their female posterity. 
To them, this government has no just powers derived from the consent of the governed. To them, this democracy is, to them, this government is not a democracy. It is not a republic. It is an odious aristocracy, a hateful oligarchy of sex, the most hateful aristocracy ever established upon the face of the globe, an oligarchy of wealth, where the rich govern the poor, an oligarchy of learning, where the educated govern the ignorant, or even an oligarchy of race, where the Saxon rules over the African, might be endured. But this oligarchy of sex, which makes father, brother, husbands, and son, the oligarchs over the mother and sisters, the wife and daughters of every household, which ordains all, all men sovereigns, all women subjects, carries dissension, discord, and rebellion into every home of the nation. Webster, Worcester, and Bouvet all define a citizen to be a person in the United States, entitled to vote and hold office. The only question left to be settled now is, are women persons? And I hardly believe any of our opponents have the hardihood to say they are not. Being persons, then, women are citizens, and no state has any right to make any law or to enforce any old law that shall abridge their privileges and immunities. Hence, every discrimination against women in the several in the laws and constitutions of the several states is today null and void, precisely as is every one against Negroes. That is just not fair. That was beautiful. <laughs> I'm so impressed and I'm so convinced, Susan. Thank you so much. I hope you don't mind, I can put that right here if I want. Um, well, I am not a historian and I'm not a prodigy, um, <laughs> <laughs> but I am a very grateful daughter. Um, I'm very grateful for the blessings of liberty. I aspire to be a great patriot, just like you. Um, and I'm very grateful for Susan and your friends who opened the door for women to be involved in public life, which I am very happy to be. Um, but as you track your lineage in time toward your revolutionary ancestors, you'll no doubt collide with the contemporaries of the suffragists. Those women, and those women and we owe a great debt of gratitude to the first American generation. Because of what the revolution established, suffragists and every other great human rights movement in this country had great ideas to rely upon. The ones that are embedded in our founding documents and in the declaration that we recited a little while ago. Last fall, I was appointed by Mitch McConnell to be on this um, commission to celebrate the 100th anniversary of, the, of uh, the, our right to vote. Um, and I just want to tell you a little bit, a little bit about this commission. Um, it is, uh, I think, oh, I've forgotten how many of us there are. I believe there are nine. But it's a very diverse group of women. Um, both sides of the aisle, different ideologies, different parties. Um, that's the first thing to know. But the second thing is all united and deeply grateful um, for our history and all grateful daughters. It's been a beautiful experience for me, especially given the environment that we're living in right now with the um, volatility in the political world to find that time of um, sisterhood um, where we differ on some things, but we're very grateful for our founding and for our right to vote. Today, as we celebrate a record number of women serving in Congress and women voting at a rate that now outpaces men, it's hard to believe that just 100 years ago that we did not have the right to vote. Voting rights for women seems, like you said, unquestionable today. Um, but as you just heard, 100 years ago, there was a fierce opposition to women gaining access to the ballot box. What some consider the beginning of the suffrage project, the Seneca Falls meeting of, of 1848, was the first women's convention in the United States. It produced a declaration called the Declaration of Sentiments that, was, that were signed by women and some men, including Susan B. Anthony's great friend, Frederick Douglass. And in this document, it communicates very directly their reliance on the founding principles that, uh, that uh, the revolutionaries uh, achieved in um, embedding them in our documents. It begins just like we just began uh, in the prelude of the uh, in the preamble. And um, 
And what they did was they, sub they, they edited it slightly to include women where they believed, and they were right, that we were not included. So it begins this way, uh, near the beginning. We hold these truths to be self-evident self that all men and women are created equal. They are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. I think you know a lot of the rest of this. <laughs> I'm going to skip to the end. Same language. Um, but when a long train of abuses and usurpations per pursuing invariably the same object evinces a design to reduce them under absolute de despotism, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for the future security. Such has been the patient sufferance of the women under this government. And now, and such, a, and, and such is now the necessity which constrains them to demand the equal station to which they were entitled. And I'm getting out my phone not to take a picture of you, but <laughs> I did do that before. Um, but um, so they, then they list what those usurpations were and what they looked like. And they paint a picture of what it looked like, very beautifully described by you, of what rights they did not have. The, the inability to govern to, to involve themselves in the government under which they participated. Um, the inability to um, gain custody of children, to have a bank account, for heaven's sakes, for um, any standing in divorce laws. Um, and and then all under the, this idea of coverture um, that Susan, you described extremely well, which was um, that you were, as you grew up, you were under the, um, all the auspices of your father he took care of everything, including the, the voting for you, including do everything for you. And then as soon as you marry, that, that, um, that responsibility shifted to your husband. Um, so they list all of these. And then at the very end, at the at end of the Declaration of, of Sentiments, um, they say, in entering upon the great work before us, we anticipate no small amount of misconception, misrepresentation, and ri ridicule. And boy, did they. But we shall use every instrumentality within our power to effect our object. We shall employ agents, circulate tracts, petition the state and national legislatures, and endeavor to enlist the pulpit and the press on our behalf. We hope this convention will, within our, will put us within our power to effect our object. We shall, I'm oh sorry, uh, well, that's basically it. So they proclaim at this first convention to America and to the world we're beginning, and we're not going to rest until we've finished. But so while, while, while some say, and we all say, you know, um, because it makes, it makes a lot of sense, that while it took 72 years from that meeting in Seneca Falls, um, from that meeting until 1920, to gain the right to vote, I think you could also say that the struggle began at the time of our founding. Given the moral weight of the revolutionaries' claims about human dignity, the principles of our founding eventually would have to apply to all in order for this great nation to stand tall and survive. In 1776, Abigail Adams, the wife of not yet President John Adams, wrote in a letter to her husband, I desire you would remember the ladies and be more generous and favorable to them than your ancestors. Do not put such unlimited power into the hands of the husbands. Remember, all men would be tyrants if they could. <laughs> Talking to her husband, of course. If particular care and attention is not paid to the ladies, we are determined to foment a rebellion, and we will not hold ourselves bound by any laws in which we have no voice or representation. What a seer she was. What a, what a poor mother she was. John would have done well to listen as all husbands come to know eventually, if they don't already. <laughs> and in the end, it took 144 years and a constitutional amendment for American women to be enfranchised. During that stretch of time, the idea of women's suffrage went from this ridiculous idea that was mocked and scorned into a winning idea in Congress and in most states. And that feeling of inevitability that it was going to happen, an incredible shift. Thanks to the tireless efforts of women that you've heard of, Susan, we all know you, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, most people know her, but the ones that also we don't know well, like Luc Lucretia Mott, Carrie Chapman Catt, uh, Lucy Stone, and others. These women, for me, in the work that I do, have taught me so much, just in reading about what they do. Their sense of strategy, their sense of PR, how to, how to get the message across in a way that doesn't alienate. I'm proud to serve as the president of the Susan B. Anthony list, so I've become acquainted with Susan B. Anthony a little bit. You and I have done some work together. Um, I'm familiar with some of her struggles. 
Um, she was an educated, passionate activist and strategist. On her mother's side, she was the daughter of the American Revolution before the organization <coughs> actually existed. She was a Quaker led by strong convictions about human dignity and humanity. She was a good friend of Frederick Douglass and considered their causes inseparable. She was principled and consistent and an unstoppable force as an advocate for, for suffrage. The 19th Amendment um, is actually called the Anthony Amendment. Eleanor Roosevelt, Marilyn Monroe, and maybe some of our moms have probably told us before that well-behaved women rarely make history. And she was certainly not well-behaved given the, uh, the environment in which she lived. She was also smart, which I keep saying, strategic and political. And um, so she, was, uh, she started to wear bloomers because it was easier to ride a bike and garden wearing bloomers. Um, but it was so um, mocked and ridiculed even by women that she stopped doing that. She put that aside and put her dress back on. Um, we're merely we'll, we're merely soldiers in petticoats. Does anybody know where that came from? Mary Poppins. Yay! Well done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she gave public speeches at a time when it was it was unheard of taboo for women to speak in public. It's hard to believe that, isn't it? Um, she uh, and and then when she was criticized, she doubled down and did more of it. She participated in the Underground Railroad. She was limitless in her ability to do every good thing that was that was deeply rooted in human dignity. Famous, in, and as you know, she got arrested for, for having the audacity to vote. She, along with um, many others, essentially declared herself a citizen under the 14th Amendment. And then along with 15 other women in Rochester, but then thousands of women on that day registered and on November, 15, no, November 5th, 1872, submitted her ballot for president. Anybody can guess who she voted for? Grant. Four days later, a deputy marshal <coughs> showed up and asked her to turn herself in. She had voted illegally, he said. Anthony demanded to be arrested properly and made him handcuff her. <laughs> Susan B. Anthony was given a judge, she was given a judge who was against women's suffrage, who would not let her speak on her own behalf in court. And the, and the judge, who was actually a Supreme Court justice, told the jury what their verdict should be. So they, of course, uh, uh, complied. She was promptly tried and found guilty and fined $100. She never paid the fine. <laughs> later, later on, um, fast forward, and there's a lot that's in the middle, of course. Um, in the early 20th century, Alice Paul, who I think did call herself a suffragette because she wanted to be aligned. She's the other, and I've, I've loved hearing that history because she wanted to be aligned with a more, um, with a more uh, radical set and others, um, led a protest in front of the White House um, leading into the First World War and, uh, and, and, and leading into it and then during it. And while their, while, while their protest was peaceful, um, it was unheard of and it was, uh, it was highly criticized. Insisting upon the rights of democracy for women, um, they burned President Wilson's speeches at what they called fire watches. Is that right? Fire watches? Yeah. Um, calling for democracy, while he was out um, proclaiming democracy around the world, he was not allowing um, democracy to flourish among half the population here. They were jailed, the suffragists were, and, uh, and beaten, and Paul was, um, they, and they were, they were uh, mistreated and brutalized in prison, and Alice Paul was even forced fed when she went on a hunger strike. The backlash resulting from that ill treatment, because they were smart enough to make sure that everything that happened there was was uh, well reported. Um, and the backlash that resulted from that and several other things, including some, uh, some uh, important matters that you mentioned, gave, led to a final giving in on the part of President Wilson. By early 1918, he, he fully endorsed suffrage. He had before been for, uh, for a state-by-state -state approach, um, thereby denying uh, women in states who, um, who who the right to vote, who state had not voted uh, for suffrage. So even, but even with his backing, it would take another two years to pass the suffrage amendment. In order to add an amendment to the Constitution, I'm sure you all know, patriots that you are, that it's two thirds majority vote of the House and the Senate, and then three quarters of the states have to approve that amendment as well. In those days, there were 38 states, so 36 were needed to ratify. North Carolina was not one. <laughs> The 19th Amendment was added to the Constitution, as you know, in, 19, in 1920. The House ratified uh, on uh, and the House ratified on June 4th. The, sen the Senate 
right, just right after. And then, and then it was a race to the states. The first states to ratify were all in the Midwest, all on one day, June 10th, 1919, um, Wisconsin, Illinois, and Michigan ratified. Then the amendment went on to a race for ratification throughout the rest of the country. It took all the way until the heat of August the following year before the amendment found its final battleground in Tennessee. Now, a lot of people ask the question, and I do too, um, about why, why the Northeast and the South held out so strongly. Um, and there are a lot of reasons, a lot of explanations for this, certainly the racism of the South um, and, uh, and, the, and in the North the need for, uh, the need for cheap labor. Um, but, but in any case, perhaps in the freer lands, in the areas where party, political parties were not that well established in the Midwest, these, they led the nation. But then it all came down to Tennessee. The, Nash, the Nashville Capitol building um, is right across the street from a beautiful hotel. I bet you've seen before, the Hermitage Hotel. It's gorgeous. And if you, if you haven't, you've got to go there. There'll be a big celebration there next year. But both the suffragists and the anti-suffragists crowd all gathered there for this final battle. They set up headquarters in the hotel, and it was all abuzz with people, and it was also a bloom with roses everywhere. It was the nicest smelling battle of the entire American <laughs> history. <laughs> the suffragists, many of whom wore white dresses, wore yellow roses on their hats and their dresses to show people, especially the legislators, where they stood. And then the women opposing suffrage wore, wore red roses. Both sides encouraged leg legislators to do the same. That way, everyone could keep track of who was with them and who was not, and they could get a good uh, vote count um, as they approached the vote. And so on the morning of the vote, any observer would have predicted that the 19th Amendment would fail. Now, if that happened, it'd be gone for a while. I mean, maybe even after World War II, it would have taken. But the representatives who, so the representatives who were wearing red roses outnumber the ones wearing yellow roses, so it seemed a foregone conclusion. The Speaker of the House in, uh, in Tennessee, who was against suffrage, decided it was the time to call the vote. And one by one, the members voted in, in according to their color um, until the roll settled on just one young man. He's our guy. <laughs> 24 years old, the youngest member of the Tennessee House, Harry Burns. You've got to look him up online. He's horrible. He's so <laughs> Harry, Bur Harry um, Byrne wore a red rose on his lapel jacket, but in his breast pocket, just a little bit closer to his heart, was a letter from his mom. It always makes me cry. It's <laughs> a bunch of moms. Um, and ur urging him to vote for women's suffrage. She was 80 years old. Um, and she wrote, vote for suffrage and don't keep them in doubt, it read. I've been watching to see how you've stood, but I haven't seen anything yet. <coughs> and so encouraging her son to vote for ratification, she says, don't forget to be a good boy. Vote for ratification. <laughs> He listened to his mother, voted yes, breaking the 48-48 tie, making history, and hastening the, uh, our involvement in political and public life and many things that went along with that. Now, no one expected Byrne to vote that way, and because there was so much buying of votes at that time, everyone started to accuse him of being bought off. Um, so he said in answering his critics, I knew that a mother's advice is always safest for a boy to follow, and my mother wanted me to vote for ratification. So thanks, moms, and be happy about your influence. Uh, and uh, we can keep on keep up keep leveraging that every time we can. So at the at the opening of the ceremony, the opening ceremony at the National uh, Museum of African American History and Culture if, in D.C. If you're there, it looks like a big basket. Um, President George Bush said, "A great nation does not hide it, hide its history; it faces its flaws and corrects them." Women throughout American history, like Abigail Adams, Susan B. Anthony, women in this room, men strong enough to listen to mom, like Harry Byrne, were determined to see that America corrected its flaws and were still on that path. The suffragist newspaper was called The Revolution. It was run by Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and it had a simple but powerful motto in the masthead. It said, men their rights and nothing more, women their rights, and nothing less. They knew that authentic human rights can never be built on the broken rights of anybody else. It wasn't necessary to take away the rights of men, but to build up the rights of women. 
that same principle of human dignity and equality was at work in all the other great human rights causes of our nation, all tapping into the ideas of the American Revolution. Suffragists like Susan B. Anthony were also fierce abolitionists. They fought to end child labor. They were temperance activists. So, so, so we may disagree with temperance, but the reason, of course, was to protect the home and what alcohol did to destroy everything that was going on at home. So that, that, that I'm including. But we, can certainly, we certainly can appreciate the conviction that great human rights causes are connected and see that unbroken line through history. Like Dr. King said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. The revolutionary movement set the stage so the abolitionist movement and the suffragist movement could move closer to justice, closer to being a more perfect union. That gift of your ancestors is inestimable. I can never say that word, inestimable. It is without measure. Our gratitude should be unbounded to those revolutionaries who gave up everything and made principles the guiding rule of our nation and not human beings. Your families have been crucial to the process of justice because of the principles they established at that foundation. Through the long battles, suffragists always reach back to that foundation to argue their cause for equal dignity and full participation in society. That now, again, I think is where we can go as, uh, as women and as people who take seriously our right to vote, is to go back to those principles in, a, in, in an environment right now which is, which is kind of tough, moving into election especially. So thank you for having me here today. I so much appreciate your friendship and your sisterhood. Oh, wait.